Support for this program comes from Jazz on the Tube, the Internet's largest collection of free streamable classic jazz videos. From Miles Davis to Louis Armstrong, from Thelonious Monk to Duke Ellington, you'll find it all on jazzonthetube.com. Start your free subscription today. Hi, and welcome to Jazz Talk, a Jazz on the Tube podcast. My name is Ken McCarthy, and this is where we talk with people who are doing important work that supports and illuminates the music we love. The writers, the scholars, the educators, the filmmakers, the producers, and more. Welcome, everybody. This is a podcast with Jazz on the Tube. Uh, We don't really have a name for it. Sometimes we call it Jazz Talk, but really we're just talking about music and life, and As you know, guys, we like to talk about how artists develop because we have a lot of students and a lot of teachers listening to these calls. And uh, it's very interesting to hear how people found jazz, how people found music in the first place, how they found their way in it, how they found jazz, how their careers developed over time. And um, I want to start off by remembering a a great interview we had with uh, Milcho uh, Leviev, I think is how you pronounce his name, the Bulgarian pianist. And we're very keenly interested in scenes. Like, what was the scene like when you were coming up? What was going on? Because, you know, for instance, Ornette had, there was a scene in Fort Worth, and he describes it very well. And there was a scene in Detroit. There was a scene in Pittsburgh. What was so interesting about the scene in Bulgaria was you weren't allowed to hear jazz. So they used to have to stay up late at night with these these manufactured radios and try to catch the signal of uh, Radio Free America, and there'd be a dozen of them, apparently, and you never knew which one was going to get the signal. And then they'd take the recording, and then they would all get together and transcribe it. Now, things weren't that way in the German scene, obviously, uh, where you came up, but every scene is different. Every scene is unique. Every scene has a character, and all these scenes give birth to all these great artists. So I wonder if we could start there and talk about how you came to music in the first place, how you discovered there was a thing called jazz, how you found your way into it, and then we'll get on with the rest of the, the uh, talk, too. Uh, okay. Well, um, I, you know, I, I, I started uh, taking piano lessons at the age of 10, and it was basically my parents' idea. It wasn't really my idea. It was I prefer to play soccer, actually. Uh, but um, so they sent me to the piano, and, and I didn't really like the lessons very much. Uh, but um, um, but I liked music. For somehow I, I I had a talent for it. Obviously, you know. And um, then when when I was fifteen or fourteen or fifteen. Um, uh, the the American forces that had like uh, came were, were like in Germany at the time. They started a place called the Boys Club at in Heidelberg, my hometown, Germany. And the Boys Club had um, had jam sessions mm. for mis- and so I went to these jam sessions to play. You know, people would play standards, and uh, uh, there were some kids who knew a little bit something about that. And there were some American players who would come to the boys' club and teach the kids mm. how to how to play these things and how to improvise on them and all that. Wow! So that was sort of the basic training, and then. Um, uh, then when I was a year or two later, there was a big concert in Heidelberg by an American band, which was basically from, you know, about a hundred mile radius around Heidelberg, there were all these army and air force uh, uh, stations, um, 
where people were in each of them had an orchestra like a big band ah. and they were like professional musicians who played in those who were in the army you know and um, so some of us gave a concert in Heidelberg and I remember going there and um, my mother like I had to sneak out of the house because I was really too young to go to places like that in the middle of the night and uh, <clears throat> and I heard that concert and and when I heard that concert, I said, that's what I want to do. Mm. I mm. want to be on that stage, mm. improvising. You know? <laughs> it, it's funny how much of the history of jazz boils down to young got kids going places they really weren't supposed to go to hear this music they really loved. That, right. that, 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 that seems to be a, 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 a theme. Hey, could I, I don't want to get off track, but I have a philosophical question. that You mentioned the word talent. And, you know, and and I wonder if talent in music is really love. In other words, you just because nobody starts out really knowing how to do anything in music, and most of us are quite clumsy when we start. And and I wonder if what what really talent is 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 passionate love that takes the form of action. In other words, you just love music so much, so hard, you're going to figure it out, no matter what it takes. And I wonder if that's what makes the difference between accomplishment and 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 not uh, accomplishment in art i it's just a philosophical question <laughs> yeah it's a good one because you hear about you know charlie parker you know apparently being so bad initially that he was thrown off the bandstand because he, he didn't know the changes and everyone ridiculed him and thought this guy's a loser he's going nowhere right. uh and and well then he he went home and he figured it out right you know so so interesting that uh and and of course We've we've actually done calls about the the inf the influence of the U.S. Armed Forces on jazz and how many jazz musicians. John Coltrane was in the Navy. He played, I believe, in, right. when he was in the Navy. And a lot of guys, even if they weren't in the band, they got their post military education at a conservatory paid for. Yeah, I mean, in my case, it got even much better, much stronger, because when I was nineteen, I got out of school. And the club had opened in Heidelberg called the K-54. And it was like uh, students that were actually film-oriented film uh, people from the university who wanted to have a club and they wanted to have jazz. And what happened is that place became like a place for all these American musicians who were jazz players to actually go there at night from, from uh, yeah, about a hundred mile radius, they all came wow. in. And I would meet people like Cedar Walton, Lex Humphreys, Don Ellis. I met Carlos Ward there where I played with later for many years. And they all came every night. And there was a jam session every night. Uh, like it was almost like being in New York, you know? It's amazing. And I, pl and I was the house I was the house piano player in that club for years. Every night we would play from nine till five in the morning, you know. Wow, and you were about 19 years old then? Yeah, I was 19, 20, 21. Like for three years, four years at least, I was in this club every day, you know. So this would have been the, the very early 50s, 1950s? Yeah, so 50, it's called Car 54 because it opened 54. Ah, oh, got it. And we, I started playing there in 55. Got it, got it. Yeah, I started playing there in 55. And I was actually, at that time, I was a conservatory student uh, preparing for a concert career in classical music. Oh, really? You know, I was actually training to be a concert pianist. And um uh, at the same time, I was studying philosophy at the university, so and I was torn between the two places. Ah. Where, you know, where, where did I want to go with the philosophy side or with the, the piano? Because the piano people, the, the 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 conservatory people, they've started talking about I have to do nothing but I have to play eight, ten hours a day mm. to train for this and. Somehow that didn't appeal to me, I, you know, 
And uh, so I ended up going to this club and playing there every night. And I got, was too tired to really practice all this classical music. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, finally, I told my piano teacher that's not what I wanted to do. You know, I didn't want to be a, a concert pianist. I wanted to play my own music. You know, gotcha. Yeah. So uh, yeah, then I, I invited the piano teacher, who was a professor, uh, to come to the club, and he said, "Well, he couldn't do that. It would be like not good for his reputation <laughs> to go to this club." And then one night he would show up with like shades and a big coat and a hat, you know. So really? would recognize him. <laughs> <laughs> and he listened to me there. And then uh, then he asked me all kinds of questions in the lessons about jazz. And then I told him, listen, I'm paying you, you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> you know, you should be telling me something rather than the other way around. So I left the conservatory and I I continued the philosophy studies, but I really became a professional jazz musician. And I landed a gig. I mean, I, out of a sudden, I, I, I learned very fast, obviously, because when I was 21, I was called by Hans Koller, who was one, who was like the top saxophonist in Europe, to play in his band. Oh. So, so we would be opening for Miles and for Mingus, and we would play the big festivals, you know. Wow! So within like a couple of years, I was on the scene, you know. At twenty-one. Yeah, twenty-two. Twenty-one, twenty-two. Yeah. And and so, and this again is mid fifties. Mid 1950s. Well, this, this was sort of. Uh, let me see. The the gigs with Carl was Carl started. Let's say 58. 58. Yeah. Wow. So that, so, you know, one of the things we have this site called Jazz on the Tube, and one of the things we do is go out and find classic jazz videos, and we're we're always so grateful for the a for the European jazz scene, and b for the how many recording how many videos and films were made. Right. So it appears that there was a just a flowering of jazz in the 1950s and 60s in in yeah. Europe specifically. Oh yeah, yeah. We had we would be working all the time. You know, like there was concerts in every every city had a budget for jazz concerts. You know. Really. Yeah. We don't even have that in the United States. Oh no, we don't have anything like that here. Has that has that persisted in Europe? Do they still support no. jazz? It, yeah, it went on for the, the whole 60s and 70s. There were like tours available where you could play four weeks every night in different cities. And the cities had budgets for that, you know. So it wasn't really like a game like today where they you play for the door or have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you have like maybe three gigs or something, you know. It's like to, at the time it was like really... That but that changed in the eighties, I think, late eighties. In Europe, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. because it's, budgets got tighter. Uh, opera house. Every, every every you know every city in in Germany had an opera house and uh, had like a symphony orchestra, so they had like fixed costs for for music for millions of dollars every every year. And jazz was just like one little thing that they added to it, you know. But so there was that a, was the first yeah. one they cut when 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 things got tight. Ah, uh, okay. But for for many, it sounds like for a couple of decades, it was always a line item on the budget. Oh, they yeah. always... oh absolutely, it was always a few hundred dollars available, you know. So you could play like two thousand dollar gigs and three thousand dollar gigs, you know. Wow. And you could come with a sextet or quintet and get paid. You know, it was really good. Yeah. And that was great money in, in those days. Exactly. And this is why all these people from New York, when I finally came here, they all made their money in Europe. You know, like everybody mm. lived here, but they all played in Europe. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, you played three times a year in Europe for four weeks and you got pay, you got to pay for the whole year, you know. Wow, so jazz so Europe not only documented a lot of things on film, they actually kept our jazz musicians paid. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> ah, amazing. Amazing. Um so 
So you, you're, you're a touring musician in, in, in Europe primarily, and uh, you're with this band, uh, and you're getting to see Miles and, 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 and uh, uh, um, yeah, that's you? where I met yeah. Eric Dolphy, for example. Oh, wow. Who I also played with. Oh, of course. And, and, uh, and then, uh, and then I started, we started playing, but, but in Germany, the scene in Germany fell apart for me in, in the early sixties, I started playing more in Paris. Mm because Paris was really the hub of jazz at the time. A lot of American jazz musicians lived there, actually. And they were like, I think something like 10 clubs going wow. at night, you know. Well, I know, did, didn't um, Bud Powell, did he live in Paris? For, yeah, yeah, he lived in Powell, Paris. Yeah, I heard Paul Powell for a year, for months, every night. Oh, but, my goodness. Because he played... He played at the Blue Note, and um, they played always the last set between two and three. And we we played at the Shaki Pesh, which ended at two o'clock. So we would rush over and hear the first, the last half hour with Bud Powell, you know. Wow. And Kenny Clark, yeah. That must have been extraordinary. I know, amazing. I mean, it we met so many people there, it was incredible. Paris was really happening like in the mid 60s it was unbelievable and that's where I met Don Cherry and started playing with Don you know that's right you were you were in a band with him yeah I was in Don Cherry's band for a few years and he brought me over to New York to do Blue Note like to do the symphony for improvisers recording oh okay so so, so you were so you went from Heidelberg and then to Paris and then uh, that's how you met uh, many people, including Don, and and Don was the reason that you ended up in the in New York. Yeah, exactly. Don brought us over here for the recording, the Blue Knot recording, and we played the five spot. And Ornette had rented the town hall for a concert for for Don. And there's, we, I met Pharaoh Sanders there and Lee Connitz and all these people. Yeah. Was this your first visit to New York? Yeah, yeah. That's, as a as a working musician, great. Right. And and this is the the nineteen sixties now, the mid nineteen sixties. Sixty six, we came over to New York. Yeah. Okay. There's a. I was in preparation for the call just to get myself in the mood. I was listening to a record from that year uh, with uh, you and Henry Grimes, the great Henry Grimes on bass, Ed Blackwell, right. Right. And, and Carlos Ward on alto saxophone. It's uh, right. uh, from now on is the right. album. Uh, so, or, so Ornette had already made his big splash. Obviously, '59 was the year where he came out and and and, right. and 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 shocked and surprised and inspired everybody. Now, I think didn't he? And then he disappeared for a while. And then he came back and um, I'm trying to figure out what it was. He was he performing in '66 or was he on? Yeah, he came back with his trumpet and his uh, violin in '66, right? Oh yeah, I mean we when. Actually, when we played in Paris, Ornette came over and played a concert, and he came to the club, and we met him there first. But then when we came to New York, we became real close. Like Ingrid and myself went over to Ornette's like every every week. Uh, we would spend time and talking and hanging out at the, at the artist's house, you know. Oh, tell, tell us about artist's house. I was too young. To realize it was there, I was just a teenager, and that uh, that was on Prince Street. Well, Ornette, most people don't know that, but Ornette was basically starting the Soho. You know, like the he was the first one to rent a loft there, of the artists, who it became like a big thing later. You know, like a, a Soho became an artist area, but it was an industrial area earlier before. And Ornette was the first one to move in there and got like two lofts, a, 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 a street street level one and then one in the third floor. And the street level one was a kind of a concert place, you know, uh, or workshop place. Yeah. Now that, now he, he got that in the, uh, did he get that in the 60s or was it in the early 70s that he... Do you recall well, when, when he had he had that place already when we got there, like '66. Oh, really? Oh, so yeah. wow! So he had Artist House a long time. Uh, maybe not. Maybe maybe he, no. Maybe he was. Let me let me think about that. 
it could be that it was more like 68 or so that he got that. Okay. And then, uh, that, then that something happened and he was out of there. Um, uh, but so there were a lot of performances I'm assuming. Yeah. At artist house. Uh, what really happened was it became like a place where, um, uh, affluent people would buy the lofts and they, and they hated to have somebody play there all the time. Oh. They, they really pushed him out. That's what I heard. It was a real terrible situation. Yeah, that's what I heard. Uh, but there were a lot of lot of performances. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, nightly or several times a week. Well, not not nightly. No, it was just like concerts. And what happened was when we started the Creative Music Studio, which was in seventy two. Uh, we did our first festival at the artist house. Oh, which was, okay. Which was in 74, I think. Yeah, 74. So was, when, when you started Creative Music Festival, did you start it in Woodstock or did you start it in New York City? Well, it, the, basically the, in, uh, the, the organizational part was... You know, like we, we just met uh, Onet and Ingrid, myself, and two lawyers. We started a nonprofit foundation, uh, and that was like uh, sealed at in at the artist house. Like we would meet there, you know, yeah. and so it was actually f formulated in uh, as early as '68 or '69, I think. And then the workshop started in Woodstock in '73. And the reason why they started in Woodstock is because I really didn't want to, uh, I really wanted to start from zero, like like people needed to uh, understand silence before they would understand sound properly. It was a really basic approach, you know, that we're taking. Uh, we want to get to the fundamentals of sound and silence and rhythm and and for the, for that you need a natural environment. You you can't really do that in a house bus of of a city like that. You know, gotcha. and I'm not a, I'm not a, a city person. You know, like I'm more like country oriented. Uh, and uh, uh, I could tell that people just had a better focus being there rather than being in a city having like another appointment two hours later or whatever. You know. They yeah, have to take them out of there. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I, you know, as you know, I live kind of in your region. I'm not not too far from where you are, yeah. and I moved here 22 years ago. And my ability to create and do things just rose exponentially. Exactly. Yeah. Well, fresh air, quiet. Uh, I, there's plenty of activity if I want the activity, but I can also just be a hermit for yeah. a long time and just do a lot of interesting things without interruption. Right. Oh, so interesting. How did you discover Woodstock? Oh, well, actually, in when we were first came to New York, we met uh, also um, a whole bunch of people in uh, in in a building in uh, uh, Brooklyn. Uh, and one of them was Marion Brown. Uh huh. And Marion Brown took us to Woodstock. Oh, really? I yeah, didn't realize he, he was a Woodstock guy. No, he said, he said to me one day, let's go up to Woodstock. I want to show you something. And he, he took us to a guy who was like an artist who had like created a whole garden and all of his trees became art objects, you know. He had like, <laughs> it was like an amazing, like really magical kind of field of sculptures and stuff. And Marin knew this guy, and so so that was like '69, I think, that he took us to Woodstock, and then we we were back in Europe for a couple of years after that uh, touring, and then we finally decided to come back to New York in '72. I said uh, we had kids. We said no, we don't want to really want to live in the city. We want to live close to the city, but far enough so it's not a suburb and Woodstock was started a place we had like in our mind you know gotcha so, and now um you know of course pat Nathaney lives or at least he used to maybe he still lives there i don't know if he still lives in the area and jack de Jeanette and yeah uh, uh 
the, I think Al Foster uh, was well, around. They, you know, the, the, as soon as we moved here, all that stuff happened. <sighs> Dave, Dave Holland moved here. Oh. Jack moved here. Carla Blay was already here. Howard Johnson moved up here. Anthony Braxton moved up here. And out of a sudden, we had like this community that we could start workshops with. So I no longer had to just do it on my own to just get everybody together and said, well, let's offer some workshops, you know. And um, they all, and Bobby Moses lived here, Richard Teitelbaum. Um, there was like some Indian musicians. There were some African guys. I mean, like, so it, from the start, it was like this community of improvisers that we could do this fundamental kind of work with, you know. How and at the time, you know, you have to see at the time, it was a completely different situation. First of all, you could rent a house for $300, you know. Second, uh, PR was like no, no, no problem. Like uh, if I would write a press release, Downbeat would print it, you know. Every magazine would print the press release. So PR was basically free. Wow. So even in 1973 already, we started our first workshops. And in 1974, we already had an international audience of, of workshop type people because they would just read the papers and they would flog up, you know. There was no such thing happening anywhere else. So, wow. So, wow, that's so fascinating. So people would come from all over the world. All over the world. Yeah. In 75, we had rented a, we had actually rented a, uh, a, a uh, what do you call it? A motel. Oh, yeah. Five buildings, 45 acres of land, a soccer field, five buildings. And, and there was about 50 people there at all times throughout. Wow. The year throughout the year you know so it was like we had like a program that would go spring spring sessions two summer sessions a fall session a winter session a new year's intensive it was like just ongoing like and it was like a always 40 50 people were there at all times you know and, and were you able to house them as well yeah, yeah, we, they lived there, we cooked there, we, we, it was a community. Yeah. Wow. I, uh, and I'm, and I'm, I'm assuming you got a lot of photos, I hope, and, and video. And... Yeah, well, we got an archive of over 500 recordings. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, I tell you, I, I, I crossed paths with Creative Music Studio because one time I was hitchhiking back from Canada and I ended up going through Woodstock, <laughs> and I was and I met somebody that was in, affiliated with the music music, community music studio, and uh, I we, I was talking about Ornette because I I knew Ornette, and so that got me sort of an entree. And I needed a shower because <laughs> I'd been on the road for <laughs> like a week, you know, hitchhiking and living on the in a sleeping bag on the side of the road, and um, it was great. I got a shower, so I thank Creative Music Studio for that. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you had a full you had a this now. Now, for young people, um, of which I'm no longer one, um, I want to give the context. I remember in the early 80s when a friend of mine got a job teaching in the jazz program at New School right. in the early 80s. And I thought, wow, that's wild. You mean they're going to give a degree for jazz? I couldn't even wrap my mind around that. You know, Now, of course, there's a thousand places to get a jazz degree. But when you were doing this with the Creative Music Studio, uh, you know, maybe there was North Texas uh, state, you know, but there were very few places that anybody could go to study creative music anywhere on the planet, right? Right. There was nothing like that happening anywhere. Incredible. Incredible. Uh, there's a video on YouTube somewhere. People can probably find it. I believe it was a festival produced by Creative Music Studio and Anthony Braxton played and I think even right. Korea came. Right. Extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, it was like a who is who. Like, you know, we we just invited all the young creative musicians who were actually doing it. It was not a teaching situation, it was like a workshop situation. Oh, so okay. the idea was really that that the people would come up and each time they were coming up for a week, let's say, 
and, and let's say Anthony Braxton would be there for a week and he would work with, let's say, 20 people uh, in an orchestral setting. And at the same time, those 20 people would form their own groups and work on their own music. And in the mornings, I would do with them what we call basic practice. We did rhythmic training, sound training, and oh. just make people understand that music, uh, there's a basis to all the different kinds of music in the world, which is the same. And you can study like these basic ideas in order to develop your own music rather than just thinking in the styles, you know, just thinking in stylistic terms, you know. Interesting. And that was a, that was a theme I know Ornette talked a lot about too. Yeah, that, well, this is, that's yeah. why we, we, that all of this came out of, these conversations with uh, with Ornette, and then also with Don Cherry, you know. Don Cherry was really like, uh, working with Don really opened up that uh, whole idea of uh, world musical communication, you know. That's another thing uh, that I want to signal to young folks. We, we now take world music for granted. Of course, yeah. we can listen to music from all corners of the earth, and that was not going on. In, no. in, when you were doing what you were doing, it was at the very early days of that, and it, when it was Don Don Cherry was one of the people. Yeah, exactly. He was. He always. He always walked around with the shortwave radio uh, earphones, you know. And he had what Don called, what the Ornette called, a uh, elephant memory, mm. which meant he could hear a song once and play it f f from, you know, he would know it. And of course, he expected us to have the same capacity, you know. <laughs> so, so you had to try to grow it. <laughs> yeah. So, so it was a little hard to work with Don, but you had to be on your toes, you know. That, and, and that's the beauty of, of the workshop setting. Uh, you're with a master musician, and he's already up here. Right. And he wants you to come up. <laughs> and exactly this and this is was so it was his creative music studio was never really a teaching place it was really more a workshop place where people would try to you know catch up with whoever is, was there showing them what they were doing you know Didn't, isn't that how mingus can uh, originally conceived of his early groups and he called them a workshop in the early 60s i believe my friend dave amram played uh he brought his uh english his French horn uh, to play with, with Mingus. And, and I believe they were calling it a workshop. Yeah, oh, I see. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so that's it. So, and so, so the people that were coming to create a music studio, they were already uh, developed musicians in the sense they were familiar with their instrument. Yeah. Usually they were people who came from other places and where they were like ready to develop their own music, you know, but they hadn't, they didn't really know, how to go about that, you know? So there's a lot, lot of that happening, you know, people who are just like, um, uh, just really eager to get their own sound happening, you know? Wow, what a, what a blessing to have a place to go with yeah. fellow musicians and master, te not master players, master musicians. Oh and, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, does this even exist anymore? Like, where can somebody do this these days? I imagine the infrastructure of creative music studios had to change because Woodstock's become, you know, an expensive, almost Beverly Hills. <laughs> Not quite that what bad. But. Was when when Reagan when Reagan came into office, um, it, all the support for that has disappeared. Mm. You know, like we had the luck that in '76 Carter came in. And uh, the, the Carter years were really the years where we were thriving because uh, we got money from the government. You know, like everybody was on the CETA program, the so-called CETA program, which was a program where every artist would get paid for what they do, no matter whether they had a job or not. This was in the U.S.? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. my goodness. I know it was it's unbelievable what Carter did and he doesn't really get enough credit over here for what he really did because we had like under Carter we had a 20 piece orchestra where everybody got paid wow in order to go in, and they played in hospitals and they played in 
they played in prisons and they played like co concerts and they would get up every morning to practice to rehearse and our staff at cms was paid you know the whole thing was like paid for and it was called the CETA program. How, what's the, is it S E? C E T A. C E T A. Yeah. I, that may explain the, the creative explosion of, for instance, the New York City loft scene in that period. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Artists had, had um, stipends, you know, from the government. They were not lots of money, it's not big money but small amounts, which is exactly what people are talking about right now. You know, there is now this organiza organization called um, Creatives, um, Creatives for New York, which is like a program that aims at having artists paid monthly for just being artists, you know, rather than for a certain kind of job. You know? And then, and as you pointed out in a, Part of it sounds like part of the CETA deal was maybe you would also perform in prisons and schools and yeah, you'd hospitals. Yeah, over. Yeah, exactly. Well, this would be a blessing for society, for the musicians, yeah. of course, but for society at large because live exactly. music, as you notice, I'm sure you've noticed, it seems to be a endangered species in some in some ways. Yeah, exactly. Now, you know, ever since Reagan came into office, um, the the whole capitalist system got like really supported in a terms of money going upwards rather than downwards you know yeah and, and you know and bringing music uh to people would be a way to start re reversing that a positive way yeah. i think the, you pain, know, the you know i i had thought at the time that um we had to sort of close shop uh, uh, that that uh, uh, campus that it was a big campus that we had we yeah. had to close it in 85 okay and uh, because you know and but i thought well now i we had maybe a thousand people there over that time uh, i would imagine this is going to filter now into the education system and people would like you know the, the universities would take over from there but the opposite happened. Like people, uh, the pro there's lots of programs, but they're all very conservative. Mm -hmm. they're all very much like into um, uh, history of music. You know, people play jazz from the '60s, uh, yeah. like 50 years later. You know, there is really not any creative kind of project going on, other than a few places. You know, there's a few sing singular teachers. Who cons but the programs themselves have become very, very much uh, stale and expensive and, and basically not creative in that same kind of uh, uh, spirit. You know? yeah, it's almost like we have the, you know, a hard bop um, uh, chamber jazz. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and, I, and I love hard bop. I love it. But, yeah. you know, there's other things people want to be doing with themselves. Right. Well, you know, it's it just uh, the industry got uh, got guided into the direction of jazz becoming something like classical music, where you know what's what it sounds like. You know? I mean, may, maybe it was an attempt at self-preservation because, as you point out, you know, the Reagan people were cutting everything, uh, uh, the, the music labels were cutting back. Well, maybe it was a, a, a misguided uh, attempt at self-preservation, but, uh, you know, obviously music is a creative endeavor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, it, yeah. So, and interestingly enough, now, now I see a lot of young people looking for the same kind of thing that we did at the time. Mm. And we now, the creative music studio is, revi is revived, actually. It's happening again in on a lot of different kinds of ways. We don't have a campus, but we have a new director. Billy Martin is running it now, mm. and um, and there's online uh, activity, and there are workshops sprouting up uh, in different places. And we had actually a five-year run uh, in the last, uh, like five years ago, uh, for summer sessions. 
and you know spring and fall sessions and so on which went only for a week at a time but uh, but at least that was happening you know so we already have like a, a probably um a hundred or two about a hundred of people or so who went through the new new creative music oh, studio wow. So actually it's it's building up again and it's building to a point where there might be a campus again. Wow. Where do you, yeah. where do you think it might be, might be? I mean I, I think the unfortunately our region has gotten pretty expensive. Yeah. And now now everything is about 10 times as much. <laughs> At least, yeah. At least. You no, know, I mean I'm seeing it like if I think about kids when 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 I came to Woodstock I, I had seven hundred dollars in my pocket, you know. That was it. And I could rent a house and I could stay there for a couple of months with and then find some way to sustain ourselves. But it was like really possible to do that. Now the same house would be like three thousand dollars. Oh yeah. You know, and uh, everything is like, you know, the 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 campus that we had rented uh, and then we actually bought was two hundred thousand dollars for the whole campus of forty five acres of land, five <laughs> buildings, fifty fifty people could stay there, uh, you know, a, a big uh, kitchen, whatever, a, a soccer field for festivals, and now that same place would be like uh, uh, about, about four million. You oh, know? millions, millions. So, uh, do, do, uh, in terms of looking for another real campus. Are, are, do you have any places in mind, any regions of the country in mind or regions of the world? You have to talk to Billy about that. Okay, I will. Billy, Billy it would be really worth your time talking to him. Uh, but you, in the meantime, you can look at uh, the website, which is called Creative Music, creativemusic.org, creativemusic.org. And there you see what's going on right now. So what's going on right now is concerts and workshops in a recording studio in Woodstock. Uh, and the, because of the pandemic, we couldn't really go into any bigger size places anyway. You know, you could not really assemble people in the last two years. Uh, so now it's just beginning to happen again that we can uh, like even think of term in terms of having live workshops, you know. So we so. got a little delayed because of that, but we also got better financial support now. Um, uh, Billy brought in the whole jam band kind of scene uh, oh. with John Medevsky and uh, and uh, it's Medevsky, Martin and Wood leading on and they're doing like benefits that bring in like $20,000 at a time. Uh, and it's beginning to, beginning to be uh, uh, more supported uh, by a larger, not just jazz musicians, but really musicians who are thinking much broader than jazz, you know, or don't think in categories. You know? So creating music really is developing more in a, avant-garde rock direction and uh, avant-garde classical direction and avant-garde world music direction, you know. Which is what, which is really what it's about. It's not about right. promoting a particular genre. It's yeah, about so it's, getting to the root. Really, and, and he is really aiming mostly for improvisation. Okay. You know? uh, and because that's like, the, that's the, that's sort of the main theme for, for Billy, you know. I wrote a book called The Music Mind Experience. I'm not sure whether you're aware of it. Mm. I should send you a copy. And uh, uh, my, my philosophy was also actually meant to improve interpretation of music, mm. which means I'm not just thinking of improvisation. I'm thinking of inter interpreters, people who play classical music or play scores, to still get into the mode of improvisation, get into the feeling of making the music up as you go, even if you know it beforehand. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, Which is important, otherwise it's it's stale. Yeah. yeah, music should always sound like it's just made up on the spot. You know, no matter whether it's three hundred years old or not. <laughs> 
you know. And, exactly. They, they, under Billy, they're really going a lot more for like really pure improvisation. And I think it's a good thing uh, because there's a lot of kids uh, from the jam band scene that are really into like really uh, improvisation, not just music, it goes beyond music. It goes into dance, it goes into visual arts, photography, film. Uh, you know, Billy is also a filmmaker, you know? Okay. And so it's, it takes on a, like a, a, a strong direction in all kinds of ways, you know? And it's really exciting, you know? I'm seeing what Billy is doing, it's really great. So, so it's on the website it, you're gonna see yeah. what what we're up to. Creativemusic.org. It sounds like after a perhaps a winter, uh, we're having a thawing and, and maybe some new sprouts coming up. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So so yeah, I'm excited about it. I'm we we you know one one of the things that came out of uh, CMS was the idea of the improvisers orchestras. Uh, because that's what we had there every week. We had the improvised orchestra there. And out of that developed all these other sound painting and whatnot, like all these orchestras that exist all around the world now. You know, and they all started there, actually, you know. Really? And now we are starting one in Kingston, New York. How are you? We're starting an orchestra at the end of this month. is the first concert. And we're going to do one every month. Uh, and it would be like 15 to 20 players, and most of them from the area, some from New York, and we're just reviving that whole thing again. Wonderful. What's the venue that you'll, that'll be playing it's in? It's a little loft. It's a small loft in the middle of, of uh, called the Shirt Factory in Kingston. Oh. And there... there one of the board members of CMS, who is a famous film, a film uh, producer, he uh, it's his loft, and he also sets up the the grant for it and raises the money. Oh, that's great! Do you, you don't happen to know the date offhand, do you? Yeah, the the first will be on April twenty four. Oh, great! And you'll be you'll be on the mailing list, you know. Oh, please! That's that's very exciting. Uh, so I, it, I'm, I'm going to put you in touch with Billy, you know. Please do. Yeah. Uh, we're doing something uh, kind of interesting. Um, I'm a frequent traveler to New Orleans, where I used to be, uh, and I'm quite involved down there. And one of the things I've wanted to do is transplant some of New Orleans second line culture to Kingston, because Kingston does have parades. It has all kinds of organizations. Yeah. But but this idea of homegrown brass bands leading public parades for fun. Right, right. Um, yeah. And so we're doing our first one. Uh, it's, it's in conjunction with the Children's Festival sometime in May. And uh, it looks like we're going to bring up a pretty good bass, brass band from the city. Um, and our dream would be to make this a regular part of Kingston life that at least once a month you could join in a parade and see a brass band and march along and dance along and just uh, make okay. Kingston. Kingston's already a very musical city, uh, but I think we could continue to help. And so I'm so thrilled at this, this new venture at the shirt right. factory. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Well, great. We're coming up on our time. Uh, what a wonderful uh, call. This is great. It took me in all kinds of directions. I didn't expect. Maybe we'll have to do another one. And I'd love to speak with Billy Martin for sure. That would yeah. be great. And I want to encourage everybody, go to creativemusic.org, see what they're up to. Yeah. I, I know we have a lot of people who are Jazz on the Tube subscribers who support jazz, or not, well, who support music and art and artists uh, in any direction they're going, as long as it's positive yeah. and creative. Uh, and so I want to encourage you to support this venture because it's it sounds like a very uh, important one. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, and as far as my own and my own and Ingrid Sertzos music and um, the, the Music Mind Experience, which is the book that I wrote, we have a Patreon program and there we have like 50 years of music goes on there. It's like the whole archive shows up there. So you may, anybody is interested in that, go to the Patreon, you know. So, so they go to Patreon and then they look for the Music Mind Experience? 
Yeah, the, yeah, the, the Music Mind Experience. The Patreon program is just my name. So you just like patreon.com and then slash and then Carl Berger. What I'll do, oh, Carl Berger, good. What I'll yeah. do is put links to Creative Music Org and the Patreon page, uh, I'll, and also a link to the Amazon where people can get the book. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, how exciting. You know, I'll tell you, you could live 10 million years and you'll never scratch the surface of all the great things that are going on in the musical world. (laughs) Right? It's just, it's amazing. It's just amazing. And uh, thank you for the time, Carl. And and we'll have to have, I'd like to talk with you more. uh, Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime. I live right here, so I'm not going anywhere. (laughs) Okay. And, And are you in Woodstock proper or in the hills? Yeah, I live in Woodstock. Yeah, directly. Yeah. Great. Great. All right. Well, Carl Berger, thank you so much. This has been Jazz on the Tube, uh, Jazz Talk. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. So long. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. (laughs) Fantastic. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you did, please share it. That's how we grow. And remember to subscribe to jazzonthetube.com, the Internet's largest collection of free, streamable, classic jazz videos.